Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone at Suntech as well. Uh, do me a favor, put on a big smile and turn to someone beside you and tell him, hey, smile there. Eh? And hey, why else do you feel so pisy to ask one another to smile? We should be having fun in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. It's all right. We'll have fun as I, as I preach. Well, um, definitely looking forward to preaching the Word of God. As you know, this past few weeks, uh, we've just been preaching what's been on our hearts. And today, I feel that the Lord wants, to, to, wants me to share with all of you about something very important that we've been talking quite a lot about ever since the G12 conference. But I think really today, that's the word that the Lord has placed upon my heart to share with all of you. And this weekend, the sermon, is, the sermon for us is called Faithfulness. I want to preach to us about this thing called faithfulness. We hear a lot about it. We talk a lot about faithfulness, but what does it really mean? Well, today, I want to teach us that faithfulness is something that is so fundamental in our walk as disciples of Jesus Christ. It is something that is so important in the eyes of our Lord. You know, we're not going to look at this passage, but if you know in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 is the book where you find the topic of the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 to 23. And it talks about all the different fruit of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, uh, self-control. And one of, the, one of the things that is the key component of the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Faithfulness is a key component of fruit of the Spirit. And what it means is this, if we do not have faithfulness, we do not have the Spirit of God within us. Or rather, if we say that we have the Spirit of God within us, then we must live out faithfulness in our lives. And so with that, I want to take a look at a part of, of a passage of Scripture where we, look, where we use a lot to teach about faithfulness, all right? Can we just turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew? Let's take our Bibles, turn to the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, all right? Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. And this is what it says there. Again, it will be like a man. Okay, this is what Jesus says. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold, he gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold, he then came. He said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold, he came up to the master. He said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. But see, here is what belongs to you. And his master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw their worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you will come and move among us this morning. We ask that you will be the preacher, you will be the teacher this morning, that our hearts will be open to receive whatever it is that you're dealing with in our lives. We ask for your pr presence to just be here. Come and speak to each and every one of us over there at Suntech as well. That today, as we are here listening to your word, we will be touched, we will be changed, we will be convicted if necessary, so that we can leave this place becoming more and more like you. So Lord, we thank you. We pray all this in your most mighty name. Amen. So this passage is something that's familiar to all of us. We know this story. And this story talks about faithfulness. And what is faithfulness all about? Well, faithfulness can simply be defined as this. Faithfulness is the quality of being trustworthy 
reliable, and true to one's word. So what does that mean? What does that mean for us as disciples of Jesus Christ? If we say that we are faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, then our lives have to be lives where Jesus is able to entrust us with the work of His kingdom. He looks at us and says, you are a reliable servant, you are a trustworthy servant, you are true to your word, and therefore I can entrust the work of our Heavenly Father's kingdom into your hands. And this passage that we've just read, it shows what's on Jesus' heart. It is here that, again, we know this famous phrase. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. And what, what does the master say here? The master did not say, well done, good and successful servant. Well done, good and humble servant. Well done, good and righteous servant. He didn't even say, well done, good and godly servant. Instead, he chose to use the word faithful. Why? Because faithfulness is something that God is looking for. In fact, if we are faithful to God, we will be righteous. If we are faithful to God, we will be holy. If we are faithful to God, we will live out godly lives. See, over here in this passage, God is not looking out for success. The first servant had five bags of gold. And in the end, he returned 10 in total to the master. The second had two bags of gold. And in the end, he returned four bags to the master. Now think about it this way. The first servant basically gave back to the master more than double what the second gave. Correct, right? The first servant, he gave 10 bags of gold. Master, I've multiplied it. You have 10 bags of gold now. The second servant, he multiplied his two bags, but he had four only. Four is less than half of 10, right? And he gave it to the, the, to the master. But regardless, Jesus refers to both these servants as good and faithful servants. He says the exact same thing to them. Why? Because God is looking for faithfulness. It was Mother Teresa who said this, God did not call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. God has not called us, church, to be successful. God has called us to be faithful. Faithfulness is, is the most important thing. It is far more important than success. Is success something good? Yes, success is something good. But you know what? Faithfulness is more important if you remember what our senior pastor said at our anniversary service just about three weeks ago, he said this, the only marker of evaluation is not the size of our church and not how many people we reach, but our faithfulness. Does that mean therefore we don't need to reach the multitudes? No, in fact, if we are faithful, we will go out and reach the multitudes. But in the, at the end of the day, God is looking at our faithfulness. See, that's why when it comes to the third servant, who did not do anything. He was not faithful to the duty entrusted to him. What happened? Jesus refers to him as wicked and lazy, and this servant was thrown outside. Now, let's think about it for a moment. Maybe some of us say, hey, that's, that's kind of unreasonable, right? Okay, it's kind of unreasonable. At least this servant, I mean, yeah, he didn't do that well, but at least the master was getting back what he had originally. Sure, he didn't gain anything more, but he didn't lose anything, right? Well, let's think about it for a moment. Is that really something to be proud of? We say like, like it's a good thing, you know? Oh, hey, I didn't gain anything, but I didn't lose anything. So you kept the status quo. Church, there's nothing proud about keeping the status quo. There's nothing, there's nothing to be proud about remaining stagnant. There's nothing proud about that. It's just like none of us will take pride if that 48 years old, we still have the same mentality of a three-year-old. We don't take pride in that. There's nothing proud in being stagnant that way. See, earlier on, I said that to be faithful, it means that we can be entrusted with the work of, the, of His kingdom. In this case of this parable, it's to be entrusted with the master's wealth. Do you know that the master didn't just give that wealth to the, the servants, you know? I want to look at a very important word found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 at the start of this parable. It says, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and what did he do? He entrusted his wealth to them. He did not give his wealth to them. He did not pass on his wealth to them. He entrusted his wealth to them. To entrust one's wealth to someone else doesn't mean you just give it to that person to hey, hold on to my money. 
If I wanted you to hold on to it, I might just say, hold on to my money or hold on to this. But when I say, I entrust you with my wealth, if someone were to come and say, I, if, if someone's going to, maybe this guy's going to pass away already, and he says, his last wish is to say, you know what, I entrust you with my family. Look after them. Does that mean you just, okay, they're just fine, I just leave them as they are? No. You've got to tend to them. You've got to tend and make sure that they improve and, and, and they have all that they need. Same thing when he entrusts his wealth to them. The role he's giving to the servants is to tend to that wealth. You see, if he did not want them to tend to it, then what's the point of passing it on to them? If he just wanted it to be safe, kept, he could have, he could have buried that gold himself. He could have, he, he's, he's a rich uh, master. I'm sure he has a vault. He has somewhere safe and secure. He could have put it, but he did not do that. You know why? Because he looks at, my, he looks at his servant and says, hey, you guys, you're more than a vault. You're more than a box, a safe box. I want you, you can do something that that box cannot do. But if you look at that third servant, that third servant did exactly that third servant is no better than a metal box. He did that same thing that a metal box would do, just hang on to it. That is not called entrusting. That is not what entrusting is all about. Now, even, even uh, in fact, if you recall what the master said to the third servant, he said this, you know, if you were really faithful, even if you don't know what to do, remember the third servant said, I was afraid. And what did the master say? Even if you, you, you didn't know what to do, even though you're unsure what to do, you could have at least placed it with the bankers. Maybe you don't have very good business acumen. Maybe you don't know how to, to, to multiply this. But the least you could have done is to put it with the bankers and at least you have got some interest. You, it would not have remained stagnant. See, the whole context of Matthew chapter 25, if you look at Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Jesus is talking about the end times. He's talking about the second coming. In the first part of Matthew chapter 25, that's where we see the parable of the virgins. And that's where we're talking about being prepared for the return of, of Jesus. In this verse 14 onwards, the parable of the servants and the gold, what is this talking about? Jesus is telling them that there will come a time near the end times that there will be a day of accounting. Remember this master left for a long time and then he came back and what does it say there? It says he came back to settle accounts. There will be a time where Jesus will come and he will look at our lives and we have to account for the things that he has entrusted us with. He has entrusted us with the work of his kingdom. He has entrusted us with our families. He has entrusted us with the people around us. He has entrusted us with his commandments. And he will look at us and he will determine whether we have been faithful servants or whether we have been lazy servants. You see, church, we have been entrusted with so many things and we're called to tend to them on behalf of of the Lord Jesus. If you are a parent, well, you'll be entrusted with a family. In fact, all of us will be entrusted to be part of a family. Whether you're a child or a children, children have to look after their parents as well. And parents have to look after children. God will hold us accountable and say, have you been faithful in that area? And many of us will be entrusted with a ministry in the church. Well, God will hold us accountable for that. But at least, at least God will, entr God will hold us accountable because He's entrusted us with His commandments. He's entrusted us with the Great Commission to go and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He will hold us accountable to that. And in the end, maybe after your whole lifetime, you committed yourself to preach and preach and preach, but you still see no fruit. That's not what God is looking for. God's not going to look at the end of the days and you're going to say that, oh, okay, you, you have, you have reached, you have found your 172, well done, good and faithful servant. Or you, you only reached your 12, you know, you are wicked and lazy servant. No. He looks at them and they are the same because he's looking for that faithfulness. He's looking out for faithfulness. In fact, if you look at what it says there in Matthew 25, that first servant, in the end, he received more at the end of the parable. Remember what happened? Because he was faithful, okay, and he, and, and when, when the master confronted that lazy servant, he said, take that gold and give it to, the, to the, the first servant. Why? Because to those who have more, more will be given. To those who have shown that they're trustworthy, that they are faithful, more will be given to them. That's why Watchman Nee says this. Watchman Nee made a statement. He says, spiritual advancement is measured by faithful obedience. 
Spiritual advancement is measured by faithful obedience. Spiritual advancement is not measured by success. Spiritual advancement is not measured by how many people you have reached out to, even though it is important to reach out to people. Spiritual advancement is measured by faithful obedience. In the end, we can come up, come up to God and say, God, I, I, I have a cell group of 200 people. But in the end, God's going to check your heart. He's going to say, what about that one time where I told you to do this and you never did it? Or what about that one time I told you to step out in faith, but you refused to and you stepped back in fear instead? See, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for our faithfulness. And you know, at this G12 conference this past few weeks, we've been talking about how God is sending His rain, how revival is coming. I believe that we want to see revival. I believe that we want to see God's rain coming to fill our land, coming to refresh us, coming to revive us. But if we look back at the key verse of the conference, Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 15, God says this, If you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today, to love the Lord your God, to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain. If you want to highlight two portions, highlight these two lines that I just mentioned. Firstly, he says, if you faithfully obey, then I will send rain in its season. The rest are all fine details that you can look at separately. But if you want to get a big picture, he's saying this, if you faithfully obey, then I will send the rain. You see, when we faithfully obey, when we are faithful, that's when we will see spiritual advancement. I'm not telling us to, oh, I want to, be, I want to, I want to advance spiritually. I want, to, I, I want to be better. I want to see the rain. It's not about chasing that. It's about chasing faithfulness. It's about saying that, God, in every situation, I'll be faithful. And as long as you're faithful in every situation, you know, without even you realizing it, the rain is there. You will see revival. You will see everything you're doing facing success. Not because you're chasing success, but because you are chasing faithfulness. And so church, today I want to teach us about faithfulness. This is everything I've just shared so far. That's just a backdrop of how faithfulness is so important to God. But if anything I want to take home today is two points. Two points on what faithfulness must be. So let me share these two points with you. Number one, faithfulness must be unconditional. Faithfulness must be unconditional. See, what this means is that our faithfulness to God must come without any strings attached. See, the problem with us is that we are very conditional people. If anything, we have been conditioned that way since we've grown up. We're always looking, we, before we do something, what do we do? We find out what is in it for me. What do I get out of this? Those are conditions. Before we make an agreement, before two people can come, into, come to a court, what happens? We lay down terms and conditions. So we end up in situations where we do the same thing with God. We give God conditions. God, I'll be faithful to you. God, I will serve you. God, I will do this. God, I will go to the ends of the earth. But you must do this, this and that. But you cannot do this, this and that. I will serve you, but you cannot do anything to my family. I cannot give up. I, I, I will serve you in all my other time, but I cannot serve you in, uh, when it comes to my job. Whatever it is, we give all kinds of conditions. And the thing is this, we end up faithful up to a point. And then suddenly we are inconvenienced, or suddenly we face an obstacle, or we disagree with something, and then we choose not to be faithful any, anymore. Faithfulness has no off switch, church. But some of us, we live our lives where there's an on and off switch. I'm faithful one moment, and I'm unfaithful in the next moment. And this is something that we can see happening throughout the Bible, especially in the, in the Old Testament with the Israelites. If there's anything we can learn from them, is that they, they showed what it means to be unfaithful. You know, I'm not here to condemn the Israelites. I'm not here to say that they are terrible, but I'm here to say that, hey, church, we need to learn from the people who have gone before us. Learn from their mistakes so that we don't have to walk the same path as well. You see, very often the Israelites in the Old Testament, we read about how they were very faithful. But the moment there was some kind of trouble, or the moment they were inconvenienced, they stopped being faithful. They became unfaithful. If anything, their faithfulness, as what they would call it, was very conditional. It was full of conditions. They will remain faithful as long as their conditions were met, their desires and their needs were also met by God. Let me give you a few examples. 
when the Israelites were being set free in the book of Exodus, when they were still in captivity in Egypt, remember they were set free, okay? And, and of course, you go up to slaves and you ask a slave, do you want to be set free? Of course, a slave will say, I want to be, I want to be set free. So they said, yes, Moses wants to come and set us free and God has given the instructions. So he said, okay, let's be faithful to God. So they obey everything that God tells them to do through Moses. Okay, they had the Passover feast, you know, they, uh, 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 they painted their doorways with, with blood so that the angel of death would pass in by. They did everything that they were told to do. And then the next day, they would leave Egypt. And when they left Egypt, what happened? They were walking out of Egypt and then Pharaoh changes his mind. He sends his army to pursue them. And how did the Israelites respond? Look at Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 12. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and carried uh, and cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. See, that right there, is a demonstration of how their faithfulness was conditional. They were willing to obey God up until they were inconvenienced. They were willing to be faithful up to the point where they were inconvenienced. The, the moment they face an obstacle, the moment they are inconvenienced, everything changes. Suddenly, instead of, yes, we want to be faithful, we want to follow God, what happens? They say to Moses, why do you bring us out here to die? Why do you bring us out here to die? It's a total transformation. And that's how they were, not just here, but throughout the books. Of Exodus. You know, there are many more uh, instances of this, you know, where the moment of inconvenience, the Israelites switch off their, their faithfulness. And sometimes we're like that as well. We'll blame the situation, we'll blame God, we'll blame our leaders, we'll, we'll give in to fear, and we just cave in. You know, what happens after that? Of course, they're terrified. And when, when the army of, of Pharaoh comes after them. But what happens? In the end, through Moses, the Lord parts the Red Sea. Okay? And once the Lord parts the Red Sea, then they're all excited. They're, oh, yes, let's go. They go through the Red Sea. They, after they exit the Red Sea, what happens in Exodus chapter 15? In Exodus 15, they've crossed through the Red Sea already. Pharaoh's army was destroyed in the Red Sea. And the moment they cross out of the area, what happened? There was a big party. You know? Go and look at Exodus chapter 15. The first part of Exodus chapter 15. There was a big celebration. There was a big party. They were celebrating. They were praising. They were worshipping God. They were dancing before Him. They were giving Him all the glory and all the honour and all the praise. And at the end of Exodus 15, they start grumbling. They start saying, Hey, we came out here, but you know what? We've got no water. All the water around this area is bitter. And they say, Oh, you brought us out here. And then, and then now it's, it's all bitter water. It's, 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 it's terrible. And then they move into Exodus chapter 16. And in Exodus chapter 16, it's the same thing, you know? Exodus 16, they suddenly, as they move on, they realize, oh, we've got not enough food. And they say, oh, you know, uh, well, you know, back in Egypt, back when we were in Egypt, we had all this, we had meat and we had so much food. You know, we should just stay in Egypt. I know we, we, we might die there, but at least we'll die surrounded by food. It's better to die here in the wilderness surrounded by nothing, you know? And you, you see, and it goes on and on and on and on. You see, and finally, another... No, actually, I can't really say finally because it goes on throughout. You see this happening throughout the Old Testament. Another example, I just want to skip ahead to, to Exodus 32. Okay? So just, bam, just keep in mind what I just shared. They were just rescued out of Egypt. Okay? And the Lord blessed them. The Lord performed many signs and wonders. But yet they keep grumbling after Him. And then finally, in Exodus chapter 32, something interesting happens. Okay, Exodus chapter 32, in, okay, in Exodus 31, Moses leaves the people for a while. Where does he go? He goes to Mount Sinai. He goes to encounter God to receive the commandments from the Lord, and the people are left on their own. So this is what happens in Exodus 32, verses 1 to 6. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your son, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. 
And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. This is what happens here. Now, you talk about being unfaithful. I don't really understand what is going on in the minds of these Israelites. Literally what happened here, right, okay, is that they had nothing better to do. If I read this, the more I read this, right, the more I come to, to, to the realization that the Israelites here really okay, nothing better to do. Why? Moses went up to the mountain. Okay, so imagine Moses, their leader, says, hey guys, you all just hang around here first, you know, I'm going to encounter God, I'm going to receive the, the word and the promises of God, and I'm going to come back and, and, and share with you guys. But you'll just stay here first, okay? And then they go. And then the people, they just hang around there, like, just hanging around, hanging around, they're just hanging about, and they're looking. It says, it says there in Exodus 32, the first verse, you know, Moses took a very long time. And so the people look, wow, this Moses fella, very long already, you know. Okay, I'll give him five more minutes. And five minutes later, okay, I'll give him two more minutes. And two minutes later, <sighs> let's, go to, let's go and find Aaron. Lah. Hey, Aaron, lah, we've been waiting very long for this Moses. So, can we do some arts and craft? <laughs> Could we build an idol? And Aaron says, oh, that's a good idea. Okay, take off all your gold stuff, okay, all your necklace, all your jewelry. Give me, give me all your gold, give me all your gold. And he fashions this fantastic-looking golden calf. And then he stands there with all the people of Israel. It's, it's like, oh, what a beautiful project we've made, okay? A star, A1 for our arts and craft project. Look at this. And then they look at all the Israel and say, Hear ye, O Israel, these are your gods that have rescued you out of Egypt. I, I cannot understand this, you know? I really cannot understand if you look at the Israelites, their faithfulness wavers. It's so conditional. The moment things are not working out in the way, maybe they don't understand what's going on. Maybe things are inconveniencing them and suddenly their faithfulness, they just switch it off. They just do something else. Okay? Oh, let's worship this gold. Let's worship this golden cup. They, they totally, they keep flipping here and there. And what does God say to them? While they were doing this, Moses is still up on Mount Sinai, and the Lord said this in Exodus 32, verses 7 to 8. The Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. The question here is this, why would the Lord say that they are quick to turn away from His commands? Why would they be quick to turn away from the Lord's commands? Because their faithfulness was conditional. Their faithfulness was conditional. If our faithfulness is truly unconditional, then we will not be quick to turn away. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. But for them, they're looking at what's happening around them. And when things are not favorable, when things inconvenience them, when they don't understand what's going on, they switch off that faithfulness. But the thing is this, church, we cannot choose as and when we want to be faithful. Faithfulness is unconditional regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstance. Just recap and look at, look at these Israelites. Israelites, literally, if I were to paint a picture from you, okay, if, if this, okay, if this is unfaithfulness, this area is unfaithfulness, and this area is faithfulness, what would the, what would the, the, the Israelites look like? Okay, we're we are here, we're in captivity, all right? And then, and, and I don't know, maybe Moses comes and say, oh, you know, the Lord wants to set you free. And of course, slaves, you know, well, I want to give freedom. Well, it's like some brave thing. Freedom! Okay, yes, let's go. Okay, let's move, let's go. Oh, we're faithful, let's obey. We're being very faithful, and we're here. And then as they go to faithfulness, they face obstacles. They see Pharaoh coming against them. Wow, Siao Leong, Pharaoh's going to come and kill us. Okay, let's go back to unfaithfulness. Okay? And then as they walk towards unfaithfulness, they say, oh, but God is making a way. He opens up the Red Sea. Oh, let's go back and be faithful again. Okay? And then, he, oh, he opened the Red Sea and he killed, uh, he destroyed Pharaoh's army. Yes, let's worship, let's worship and celebrate. Wow, shock. Uh, after we party already, we dance already. Wow, oh, very thirsty. Let's drink the water around us. Hey, it's very bitter. Wow, oh, God, oh, Moses, you're terrible people. Give us bitter water. Okay, we go back to, to unfaithfulness. 
Okay? And so God, if you, if, you, if you look at Exodus 15, God instructs Moses how to get water from wood. And he, and he said, oh, God provides water. Oh, let's, let's go back away, back to being faithful. And then, oh, you know, after we drink already, wow, now we're, 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 our, our thirst is, is quenched. But, hey, very hungry, ah. Uh. Wow, there's no food here. Wow, it's going to bring us out here. Die, you know, Egypt got a lot of meat already. Back to unfaithfulness. Okay? And then God provides them quail and manna. He said, oh, yeah, quail and manna. Okay, yeah, back to being faithful. And after that, all, well, eat quail and manna every day. Very sad, you know. Ah, let's go back to unfaithfulness. And they spend their time going to and fro. This is the Israelites all the time in the Old Testament. You go beyond that. You go into the days of Joshua, into the days of Judges, into the days of the kings. It's the same thing over and over and over again. You see, that is what we can learn, that that's not what faithfulness is. You see, faithfulness is when you stay the course all the way. Church, listen to this. Think about it in, a term, in terms of a marriage. Someone who is 90% faithful to his or her spouse is not faithful at all. There's no such thing as part-time loyalty. There's no such thing as part-time loyalty. Faithfulness must be unconditional. Where we stay the course, come hell or high water, regardless of the situation, we will continue working and walking with God. That is faithfulness. The Bible is a good example of someone who was faithful, regardless of the situation. A man by the name of Job. Remember Job? And I, I find that no matter what happened, I think the most poignant belief that Job held on to is what he said in Job chapter 2, verses 7 to 10. It says, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped, scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. And he replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Shall we accept the good and not the bad? See, the Israelites were not willing to accept the bad. They only wanted the good. They wanted what they wanted, not what God wanted. They wanted to fulfill their conditions, their desires, and their needs. But Job was different. But church, make no mistake, you know, if you read the book of Job, Job went through a terrible period of time. His faithfulness, in a sense, was tested. He struggled in the area. He felt grief. He had to endure physical pain. He lost practically all that he had. But yet, through it all, he remained faithful. It was not an easy time, you know. It was difficult. He faced obstacles as well. He faced inconveniences as well. But he chose to stay faithful. You know why? Because this, I believe this sums up how Job felt. Faithfulness is always more important than favorable conditions. Faithfulness is always more important than favorable conditions. In fact, I want to add this, church, that if we focus on being faithful, favorable conditions will come. When we choose to be faithful in every situation, maybe not immediately, but eventually favorable conditions will come your way. The problem is this. Many of us are not willing to wait. We want to dash for these favorable conditions. We want to pursue favorable conditions. But God has never called us to pursue favorable conditions. God has never called us to pursue success. God has always called us to pursue Him. And when we pursue Him, all these things will be added unto us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. That's how it works. That's why in Matthew 25, 29, it says, For whoever has been given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. This is exactly like what Jesus says. What does he say? If any man wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, he must carry his cross and follow me. Whoever, who, uh, um, um, whoever wants to gain his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. That is how it works here. So church... It's not about looking for favorable conditions. It's about being faithful. If we're in a bad situation right now, we look at our work, you know, oh, I don't know if I should continue being here. You know, everything is like falling apart around me. You know what? Don't look at the conditions around you. Look to God. Ask God, God, what are you telling me? God, if you're telling me to stay, I will stay. If you're telling me to go, I will go. It's not about the condition around me. If I go, it's not because... You know, all hell may be breaking loose around me, but if I leave this place, it's not because all hell is breaking loose, it's because God told me to go. 
If he doesn't say that, I will stay. That is unconditional faithfulness. And church, today we need to check ourselves. Are, are we in that position? Are we in a position where we've been very conditional with God? We give God terms and conditions. Today we need to stop that. Because that is not faithfulness. We're no different from the Israelites who are one moment faithful, one moment unfaithful. When things work out, we're very faithful. When things don't work out, we're not very faithful. In fact, there's no such thing as not very faithful. Not, be, not very faithful is unfaithful. Let's, let's, let's get that concept right. Some of us, I know sometimes we, we try to make it sound a bit nice and oh, you know, pastor, I've, I've not been very faithful in, in, in prayer and everything. No, no, it's not I've not been very faithful. It's I've been unfaithful. 90% faithfulness is 100% unfaithfulness. Okay? Ask, ask any husband or wife. That's how it works. There's no such thing as part-time loyalty. There's no such thing as part-time faithfulness. So church, today, we must understand. Let's be like Job, where our faithfulness is unconditional. Come hell or high water, come what, what may, we will serve the Lord. And so that's what we need to learn about faithfulness. Number one, faithfulness must be unconditional. But there's a second thing that I want us to know today. That more than just being unconditional, faithfulness is something that also must be perpetual. Faithfulness must be perpetual. What does perpetual mean? Perpetual means it's timeless. It goes on and on and on and on. We cannot set a timeline to faithfulness. There is no time stamp to faithfulness. We don't, when the moment we become Christians, we're not given a faithfulness punch card where we clock in right now. And after 30 years, we can clock out and that's it, we're done. That's not how faithfulness works. You see, we have this idea sometimes. Maybe we don't articulate it this way, but this is what we actually feel subconsciously. We think that being faithful for a certain duration is more than enough. Some of us, well, certainly it's a, it, it, it is a feat to be faithful to your spouse for 30 years, but it's not the end. If you're married for 30 years, do you say, wow, I've been faithful. For, you go to your husband and your wife, Oi, you know, we've been faithful for 30 years. I think it's time we can do something else. Lah. It's not how it works, right? And there's not faithfulness. You cannot put a time stamp on that. Your faithfulness to your spouse must be something that's perpetual. It goes on and on and on. Same thing, our faithfulness to God must be perpetual. It goes on and on and on. Let's go back and look at this parable in Matthew 25. Do you know that their faithfulness of these servants, the, the, the faithfulness of these servants were tested for a very long time? It says there in the Bible, you know, in Matthew 25, verses, in verse 19, it says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. After a long time. Now, how long is long? How long is long? Ah? Right. The Bible says long. Sometimes we may read the Bible, it's after a long time. Oh, you know, long is subjective. To some people, long may not be that long. Maybe he's just gone a, a, a year. Okay. When he says long here, it is long. Okay. How do we know that? A few, uh, 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 a few things. Number one, it was long enough that these disciples could invest that money and turn a profit. Of the of 100 percent, okay, five five uh, bags of gold became ten, two became four. There was enough time for that. Number two, the master says, even if you had done nothing, that one bag of gold, the least amount, if you had put it in the bank, I would have gotten some interest on it. Now, for this least amount to gain a significant interest, would have to be a decently long time, okay. And the third reason I will tell you it's a very long time. Again, what is the context of this? Is a parable that Jesus used to explain. His return. When Jesus left on this journey, when He ascended to heaven, until the day He returns, well, let's, let's think about history. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. See, He tested the faithfulness of these servants for a very long time. But whatever it is, you know, you know what's the interesting thing? Is that it doesn't end right there, you know? The test of their faithfulness actually went on. It did not end right there and then. Let me show you something. What happens to the first two servants? What does the master, what does Jesus say to the first two servants? He says the exact same thing to them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. It's almost like whatever you've just done, there's just a foretaste of what's to come. Now, you can be ready for more things. 
The test of faithfulness is carrying on. He's still working on. You see, faithfulness doesn't end there, you know. Just because, you know, we, the servants cannot be, have this mentality that, wow, oh, okay, I'm just waiting for the master to return. The master returns, and the moment he says, good and faithful servant, wow, it's like a stamp of approval. Wow, yes, I've made it, okay, now I can be unfaithful anymore. That's not how it works, right? Think about it. If, you, that, if that servant is like that, okay, master, I've been faithful. You gave me five bags of gold, and here there's ten bags. You can take it. It's all for you. And the master looks at him, wow, well done, good and faithful servant. You have done well. You are faithful. And the servant said, yes, wow, I'm so faithful. Hallelujah, you have given me approval. I take out a knife, stab him, take out a go and run. Is that faithful? It's not faithful. You cannot consider it as faithfulness. Why? Because there's no time to faithfulness. Just because you've been faithful for 30 years and then you're not faithful after that, that means that you've not been faithful. Faithfulness is perpetual. It is something that goes on and on and on. We must continue to be faithful every single moment of our lives. It was Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. This is what he says. I know of nothing which I would choose to have as a subject of my ambition for life than to be kept faithful to my God till death, still to be a soul winner, still to be a true herald of the cross and testify the name of Jesus to the very last hour. It is only such who in the ministry shall be saved. His only ambition for life is to be kept faithful until the very end. He wants to be faithful all the way to the very end. You know, this reminds me of a story that my dad used to tell me. He told me about this very old, uh, a senior pastor, not the position, but he's very senior in age. And I think this pastor was one of his lecturers when he was in a seminary. And when the students asked, okay, uh, uh, this professor, what was part of his daily prayer? And this pastor, this lecturer will say, my prayer is that I will not fall into adultery. It's something I pray every day. And when my dad described this professor, he said, it's very funny when you think about that. This pastor was very old. He was like in his 80s, 90s. Okay? He was very frail looking. He's not good looking. He's wrinkled all, all over. And he says, we don't even know how possible it is for him at his age to be sexually active anymore. But yet his prayer is that he will not fall into adultery. Why? Maybe he knew that was his weakness. That was an area he struggled with all his life. But wherever it was, his priority until the day he goes and returns to be with the Lord, his priority was to be kept faithful to God and to his wife perpetually. Not for the... They, not for the first 30 years, not for the first 60 years, not for a certain time frame or time duration, no. Perpetually, until he returns to be with his heavenly father. In the book of Revelation, we went through the book of Revelation a couple of years ago, right? Remember, in the book of Revelation, there were seven churches that had letters to them. And out of these seven churches, one church was called this. One church was called the Faithful Church. This was the church of Philadelphia, and it says in Revelation chapter 3, verses 8 to 10, Jesus says this to them, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, and they lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on earth. If you read these three verses here, basically what is Jesus saying to this church? Jesus, if, if I may, if I may summarize what Jesus is saying to them, He's saying to this church, well done, good and faithful servant. But what's interesting is what He immediately says after that. In verse 11, Jesus says this, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Three interesting things from this one verse. Firstly, I'm coming quickly. Jesus says, I'm, I'm returning, the sec which means that the end is near. The second thing is that he says, hold fast, persevere, continue to be faithful. And the third one is that so that no one can take your crown. Why is this so interesting? This is interesting because it's near the end. If anything, they are closer to the finishing line than they have ever been. And what does Jesus say? He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Continue to be faithful. 
so that you do not have your crown taken from you. Jesus is saying this, until the end, you must be faithful. You must be faithful all the way until the end. And if you reach, you know what? Almost reaching the finishing line is not the end yet. You're close to the end, but you've not reached the end yet. And if at that moment you stumble, that crown will be taken from you. If at that last moment, that last second, you are found to be unfaithful, then you're unfaithful. I think it's so interesting that that's how Jesus describes it. It's already ending. He says, hold fast, persevere in your faithfulness so that no one can take your crown. You see, in the end, Jesus is looking for faithful people. That's why in the end times, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, it says this, and with him will be his called, his chosen, and his faithful followers. He's looking for faithful followers. Church, are there some of us here today that we've been putting a time stamp or a time, uh, we've been putting a fixed duration for our faithfulness? You know, I'm not here to condemn anyone to say, wow, you're terrible. If anything, today this message is, about, is to call us back to faithfulness if some of us have, have wavered and for the rest of us to commit ourselves to say that we'll be faithful until the very end. But frankly, these are things I've heard in the church where people have said, oh, you know, oh yeah, uh, yeah I, was, I was a leader back in the day. I was a leader for a good 15, 20 years at the church, but you know, now I take a step back and let someone else do it, you know. Today, the Lord is challenging us if any of us have this mentality. Why? Because, let me just be blunt about it, there's unfaithfulness. There's no 90% faithfulness. We, in, the, in, in the end, on the day of accounting, are we going to go up to God and say, God, uh, uh, God, maybe God looks at us and says, oh, you've been a wicked and lazy servant. And you say, hey, God, God, but, but when I came to church, I served for 10 years, 20 years in the church. Do you think that really holds any water? That is like us. It's like what we say about non-believers you know, or people who, who on the day of accounting, they look bef- the, before God, before His throne of judgment, and they say, God, I used to go to church as a kid. I used, I used to go to chapel in school. I used to pray when the teacher told me. Does that, that, that doesn't hold any water. Church, then why do we do that? We as disciples of Jesus Christ, we who have an understanding of His Scripture, why do we do that same thing? That is the same thing. And today, I'm, I want to encourage us. It's time to stop staying in that position. It's time to stop being stagnant. Let's not be that servant who buries that gold in the ground. For some of us here, we are burying ourselves in that ground. And at the end of time, when God holds us for accounting, just remember, He's not looking at how successful you've been. He's looking at how faithful you have been. So let's stop putting a duration on faithfulness. Our prayer should be, God, help me be faithful all the way. You know, I remember at this G12 conference, one of the, as I was, we were doing just some sharing with our, uh, Serena and I were doing our sharing of our own 12, and many of them, they shared, one of the most precious moments at this conference was, if you recall, on Saturday night, if you, if you weren't there, let me give you an update what happened. On Saturday night, Pastor Caesar walked down and he interviewed some people, asked them how they feel about the conference, and he came to my dad, and he asked, he said, Pastor Kong, how do you feel about celebrating 40 years in the ministry? And then my dad broke down and cried. Because you know, what, what did he say? He said, I thank God for the 40 years, but I'm afraid I cannot serve the next 40 years. And a lot of people took back that moment. Why? Because here you hear the heartbeat of this pastor why was he afraid that he cannot serve for 40 years? If you, if you remember that week, he went for that, um, that heart procedure, okay? And, and he, was, he was worried. We thank God for, for all your prayers and everything, but one of his blood vessels, to the, one of the key blood vessels was 90% blocked, okay? And, and basically, if he didn't go for that procedure, he was heading for a heart attack. So he, he, he was concerned, but look at his heartbeat. His heartbeat is that he wants to serve another 40 years. See, many people... And this is very true within the church, and I've seen many of, uh, 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 of it, especially in, in other countries where a lot of the pastors, right, them being a pastor is nothing more than a job. 
They really have a track. You know, you serve in a church for X number of years and then you, you will retire, you get a pension, your family is looked after. That's how some churches operate around the world. And there are these pastors who go for that, you know. They say, oh, after 40 years, you know, it's time, it's time to retire. That's, that's enough. But you know what? That's not how faithfulness works. Yes, maybe you can retire formally from a position in the church, but you can still go on serving Him. Faithfulness is something that must go on all the way to the very end. And so church, today there's two things I want to share with all of us. Faithfulness. Faithfulness must be, number one, unconditional. Come hell or high water, no matter what happens around us, no matter how inconvenienced we are, we will remain faithful. Number two, faithfulness must be something perpetual. It means that it's timeless. There is no duration to faithfulness. If we've been faithful for 30 years, we go for another 30 years. We go for all the way to the very end. It doesn't end just because we hit a certain milestone or a certain time. And you know, we talk about faithfulness being something that's unconditional, something that's being perpetual. Well, I want to share with you my own journey in this area of, of faithfulness. And with then after that, I'm just going to share a bit more and then we're going to close off this service. But this is my journey in the area of faithfulness. As you know, for the, for the past few years, I've been, for the past four years, I've been, I've been heading up two departments, really, in, in, in FCBC. I've been heading up the worship ministry, and I've been heading up the creative department as well. And so I've been running the GTOL conferences, a lot of our special events, and you've, I know you've seen me leading worship up on stage many times, and, and I do enjoy serving the Lord up here in, in, in the area of worship. But you know something? I, was never, I never ever felt that I was called to the area of worship. I never ever thought I could serve the Lord in this way. In fact, many years, when I first became a pastor, back then, our worship pastor, he asked me to join the worship ministry as a singer, as a vocalist. And I said, no. Why? Because, well, to be frank, I, I don't think I can sing. Even today, I don't, I'm, I'm definitely not a very, I'm not one of the best singers. That many of our volunteers are far better than I am. And I don't think I'm a, I'm a very good singer. I, I, I don't like my voice. I've got no talent in this area. I can't. So I told him, you know what? Uh, I, I don't think I, w- I, I will do well in this, so I don't want. So he said, okay, la. okay, fine. Don't be. Well, after we ended that conversation, he went to have a conversation with my dad. He said, hey, Pastor Kong, you know, Daniel should be a worship leader. You know? He'll be do, it, do him good. Good training on the platform. You know, he'll train him to be a better preacher and everything. He'll challenge his faith. And my, and my dad said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and so he came to me and he said, hey, Daniel, you're going to join the worship ministry? I said, no, no, I said that. I'm not ready. He said, you're joining the worship ministry. Your, pa- your father said so. <laughs> okay, la, I win now. So, okay, la, I... So I joined the worship ministry became uh, a worship leader. I was training every day and I, I hated it. I, I, I did very badly for all the training classes, you know. I felt I felt very stressed, you know. Okay, you sing, you know, engage your diaphragm. You know, singing, I think I got learned how to breathe. I was like, huh? I don't know. It's so complicated to breathe. I don't know. How do I breathe? I don't even know how I'm breathing anymore. I can't sing. You're very kanchong, you know. Okay, I was very stressed throughout the whole training phase and every day, I got to go and rehearse for one hour and he'll check, uh, this pastor will inspect me, how, what do you train for this one hour? I have to fill up a log on what I rehearsed for this one hour and I was just very stressed. And I remember the, one of the first few times I was assigned to sing was a prayer meeting. Back then, we were still at the Max Pavilion. And remember, we have our Wednesday night church-wide prayer meetings last time. Okay, so it was, the whole Max Pavilion was opened up. And... I was told to join that team and for some reason, the worship leader asked me to sing a solo, you know, okay? And that's one of the first few times I was ever up on stage. I asked me to sing a solo and I'm not, not even at some small gathering, it's at Max Pavilion. And so, I went there and at 6.30, the prayer meeting starts at 7.30. At 6.30, uh, there's like a sound check in the rear. So, so I was, they say, okay, Daniel, sing. So I was singing, singing, singing. And then at that moment, the pastor arrives and he comes in through the back, he hears me singing and suddenly, what well, he... He makes his way to the front. And he comes to me and says, Daniel, that's terrible. And so he takes me, he brings me to a room backstage. And he rehearses with me over and over again. Basically, he's, okay, sing that part. No good, sing again. No good, sing again. No good, sing again. No good, sing again. He did, we did this until 7.25. 7.25 p.m. 7.30, the worship was going to start. And at 7.25, thereabouts, he looks at me and he says, 
Oh, that's terrible, but you have to do. So, I get up on stage and I tell you, I, I, was, I was a nervous wreck. It's like when I hear that, I, I, was, I, was, I was so blurred at that moment. I was like, oh, Rios, I was singing, oh, what do I, I, I go, go, where's the stage? Oh, there, there, okay, okay. I, I have no idea what's going on. And I get up on stage and I was like, God, help me. I need your help. And I stand up there and I just remember, I just made this prayer, say, God, just help me enjoy being in your presence. I don't care how good or bad it is, just let me do what I need to do. And as I prayed, I just suddenly felt the presence of God descend. And I got caught up in that whole atmosphere of worship. I remember we started worshipping, we were singing, and I, I thought I was jumping. I was just giving it all that I had. I just enjoyed being in the presence of God. And I was just soaking, just soaking in the presence of God. And, and I was just standing there like an idiot, you know, I just saying, you know, like just, and when you're enjoying, you're just not, I'm just not conscious of what's going on anymore. Just so happy being in the presence of the Lord. Just soaking. And then suddenly I hear, hey, it's very quiet. Huh? I open my eyes. Then I look at the keyboardist. And the keyboardist is like, Dum. and I was like, it's my solo. I'm supposed to sing. And honest, okay. I was up there, I was like, oh crap. I didn't really say crap, but let's just leave it as that. I was like, oh, then I think at that moment, you know what happened? At the moment, this happened. I could, I kid you not, I could not control my legs, okay? Camera, you can take a wider shot, you know, people at Suntec don't know what happened. Okay? I, I started shaking, my legs started shaking like that, you know. I've never encountered that. I, I'm quite steady, and you know? I've never shaken until I cannot control my leg. And, and, and it's, it's not my father that kind. It's not that he's his anointing, all right? That's when the fire of God is coming, okay? My, this, this was uncontrollable nerve, uh, anxiety, you know? And I think I understood what it means when you say you're gripped by fear. I could not control, I, you know, it's, I try and, I was like, listen to me, listen to me. It's like, cannot, it's just, just shaking, you know? And you see this idiot on stage. You know, and you just, 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 just so nervous. And now there's one, there's one thing that happens when I'm very nervous. I didn't share with you what happened uh, before that when I was still rehearsing. When I'm very nervous, uh, I drink a lot of water. When I was backstage rehearsing, I was so nervous I drank three 500 ml bottles of water. Then because I rehearsed all the way up to the time that we were standby, right, I didn't get to go to relieve myself. And suddenly I'm at that moment. Shaking there, I cannot control, I couldn't control myself, and I peed in my pants on stage. I kid you not, I peed in my pants. That's how nervous I felt. And so, I th- honestly, right, I don't really remember what happened after that. I just sang, I don't know, whatever, and, and, I, I, and I got down. And I remember that night, I felt terrible. I felt humiliated, I felt worthless, I felt stupid, I felt, you know, I kept scolding myself. I said, you're what kind of person are you? I, I, as a grown man, I don't know about a kid, like, ask my mom. As a grown man, I've never peed in my pants. Okay, that was the first time ever. Okay, and I don't know if you ever encountered a moment. It's it's one kind of sickening when you lose control of yourself. You're so gripped by fear, you cannot control yourself, and it was a terrible moment. And from that day onwards, I said this: I'm going to quit the worship ministry. I said I will quit the worship ministry. So I decided. Okay, I, so for the next few weeks, right, I kept planning how to quit the worship ministry, you know, what, write, write letter, everything, uh, uh, keep giving, trying to, give, trying to give spiritual reasons why I should not be in the worship ministry, you know, so it took some time to prepare that, but before I could actually tender my resignation from the worship ministry, I went to a pastor's prayer summit, I love Singapore is the pastor's prayer summit up in uh, Malacca every year, I went there, and that year the church anchoring it was Church of Our Saviour, and they made us habit at that, that prayer summit, they say, every time we worship, we want to release intercessors to go and give people words. And so they want to worship, I'm just standing there, you know. My whole, you know, we go prayer summit is to pray, right? I went there to pray, God, give me the words so I can resign from the worship ministry. But I can still sound very spiritual and very holy, you know. So that's, that was my prayer. And then this person from Church of Our Saviour came up to me. I don't know him, he doesn't know me. And he said, I have a word for you from the Lord. And I was like, oh, okay, I want to receive the word. Maybe that's why. Give me the words to write in the resignation letter. And he said, the Lord gave me a picture of an empty musical score. 
And he says he's going to use you to fill up this, this score with music for him. And I stood there and I was like, Oh God. <laughs> Not like that, leh. <laughs> but I, re- I received that word. And I, I knew what God was, was saying. God was challenging my faithfulness. God was challenging me. He said, Daniel, do you think I put you there just so that you can feel humiliated? Do you think I enjoy you feeling that way? Do you think I put you there just so that I can... You think like, my, like, like God is up in the heavens and he gathers angels hey see this guy pee in the stage huh? God doesn't do that and God said there's a reason there's a reason that placed you there and I did not know it then but after that in the next two years well one thing led to another and we had some of our worship staff leave the church and as a result somehow I ended up being appointed as the worship pastor. And I look back at this. I look back at how the Lord was challenging me to be faithful. And I realized why faithfulness is so important to God. Faithfulness is so important to God because faithfulness is His attribute. As I look back in this, in my own story, I'm not, I'm not trying to how let you know I'm a very faithful person. No. If anything, I just realized this. The reason I can be faithful is because God Himself is faithful. When I didn't understand, when I felt inconvenience, when I got extra job to do a thing about worship stuff, when I when I didn't understand what's going on, when I felt humiliated, when I felt like I was a big obstacle, when I felt inconvenienced by this thing, when I was becoming unfaithful, God was still faithful. Because he already had a plan. He had a purpose, he had a destiny for me in that moment already. And I realize that's why his word says this in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, great is his faithfulness. And Max Lucado says this. He says, God is faithful even when His children are not. And church, that's the most important thing I want us to take back from this is that we can be faithful because God has demonstrated what it means to be faithful. He is so, he is so faithful to us. Even though we, we put a time duration on our faithfulness, even though we are very conditional with our faithfulness, you know what? His faithfulness to us is unconditional and more than just His faithfulness being perpetual, His faithfulness is eternal. And if we are called to be imitators of Christ, then we must be faithful because He is faithful. You know, I, I told you just now, you look at the Old Testament, you see how the Israelites keep wavering between faithfulness and unfaithfulness. They're faithful. And, and you, you see this pattern. Israelites, they're faithful for a moment. Well, a man of God rises up, calls them to serve God. They're very faithful. And after they're faithful for a certain time, they fall into sin. They fall into idolatry. They become unfaithful. And after they're unfaithful for a period of time, what happened? God raises up a prophet. He raises up a judge to come and call them back to Him. And they become faithful again. And after time, they, become, they, they fall into sin, they start to worship idols again. And after that, what happens? God raises up men and women over and over again. And then they become faithful again. And after they are faithful, they fall into sin, they fall into idolatry. And what does God do? He raises up another man or woman and He does that over and over again. And I know a lot of people, I say, a, lot of, a lot of non-Christians say this to me, you know. Look at the Bible, the Old Testament. There's the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. The Old, God, Old Testament God is an angry God a destructive God I say you don't understand the Bible at all the Old Testament is where you see such a powerful outpouring of God's grace and mercy because through the Old Testament we see His faithfulness no matter how many times they reject Him before they became a kingdom after the book of Judges you know why they became a kingdom? because Israel rejected God as their king 
They said, give us a human king. And even when they reject God like that, God never gave up on them. God was faithful. He kept restoring them. But of course, just remember, God, He's faithful, but He's also just. And they have to be taken into account. So when Moses' generation fell into sin, they could not enter the promised land. If we look at how the kingdom of, uh, how Israel, one, one nation, eventually became divided into the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, and how eventually both these kingdoms were practically wiped off the face of the earth. That was God being a just God because they had to answer for their sins. But even though they sinned, even though they were unfaithful, God still never gave up. After they were, after the, both kingdoms were destroyed, after they were exiled to Babylon, and we talk about Zechariah, right? The book of Zechariah. What happened to Zechariah? God raises up a remnant, releases them back to Israel to start building again. If God wanted to annihilate them, He could have done it any time. But He doesn't because He's faithful. It's the same for us, you know. We may be unfaithful. We may have been conditional. We may be like Israel. One moment faithful, one moment not. One moment faithful, one moment not. Maybe some of us, will be, we were faithful, but now we're not at this moment. Well, God is not here to condemn you. God is here to call us back because He is a faithful God. And He says, today come and commit yourself to faithfulness. The moment I'm going to just lead us in a time of prayer. But before that, today I want to say that this word is specifically for some people. I've got some words I'll release later as well. But as I was preparing this message, the Lord gave me four words, four, four groups of people to talk to. The first group are those of us here, we've been, you were serving God once, but now you're no longer serving Him for whatever reason. I don't know what the reason is. It can be a legitimate one, it can be an illegitimate one, whatever it is. But I want to share this with you. Rick Warren says this, faithful servants never retire. You can retire from your career, but you will never retire from serving God. That's what our senior pastor demonstrates to us. Second group of people that some of us here, you've not been to church for a long time, you, for some, you've backslidden, but for some reason you're here today. God is calling you back. He is faithful. He knows what you've done. He knows how far you, you have been. But Romans 8, 38 to 39 says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves you and is calling back to you. You calling you back to him. Because he loves you, he's faithful. The third group is that there's some of us here. We've been given, we've been giving reasons or excuses for not being faithful in serving. Oh, you know, I used to do it already, oh, but now, now I cannot, you know, it's a new season, oh, I got this, I got that. Look, I understand that there are seasons. I look, they understand that there are times that we may not be able to serve at the same capacity that we used to. But the important thing is that we continue serving. Some of us have totally used it as, as, as excuses and we have disconnected from it already. But you know what? We're entering the time of breakthrough. We're entering in a time of, of revival. And it's going to pass you by if you completely use those excuses. And Stephen Furtick, he says this, your breakthrough begins where your excuses end. Your breakthrough will begin where your excuses end. Let's stop using these inconveniences as reasons why we cannot serve, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. There's enough in the Bible of people who have done that. Moses, you know, I cannot, I'm slow of speech or whatever. You know what? You're not going to have that breakthrough until all these excuses end. And the last group of people, there's some of us here who, we have stopped being faithful because we're stuck in our past. We're looking back and say, oh, you know, oh, it used to be like that. Maybe you're looking back at FCBC and oh, it used to be like that, but now we're not, oh, whatever. We're stuck in that past. Some of us, maybe we stopped serving God. We stopped, in a sense, we stopped being faithful because we're looking back at those past hurts that we've had. Well, you know what? You're going to miss out on the rain that is here. You're going to miss out on the revival that is here. You need to let go. You need to get up and get going. One of the best things I took back from this conference was what Pastor Bray simply said. He said, God wants you to live in present revelation rather than past experiences. Today, let's not miss out on the present revelation. And I know here there's some of us that we've never given a life to Jesus before. The present revelation for you is this. God is a faithful God and He's calling out to you.
He is faithful that even though we've fallen away from Him, you know the Word of God says that all have sinned and fall short of God's standards. But even though we've fallen short, He is still faithful. He still sent His Son to come and die on the cross so that our sins can be removed and we can be restored. That is faithfulness. So the Word of God says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, so that through Him, he may, the world may be saved. Today, the Lord's presence is here. The Lord is calling out to you. Can I invite all of us to just close our eyes and bow our heads at this moment? Over here, up in the balcony, over there in Sun Tech City as well. The Lord wants to speak to you. And I know that some of us here, you've never given your life to Jesus before. Today, the Lord wants to give you an opportunity to respond. He wants you to know for yourself that He is a faithful God. If anything else, it's a challenge today. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Today, He's calling you to come and encounter His faithfulness. Some of us may feel that, oh, you know, I've got a bad history. I've done many things. You know what? Today, the Lord says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Today is time to enter into a present revelation. And so, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. How is that going to be done? I'm going to lead us into a time of prayer. And I'm going to pray out loud. And I'm going to say my prayer. I'm going to pray line by line. And I want to invite all those of us who want to respond today to give their life to Jesus, to pray along with me out loud. I say one line and then you say one line and the Christians here pray along as well so that we can pray together as a family. And maybe you've never given life to Jesus today, why don't you pray that prayer? Even if you're, that's you, you're the backslidden one, you've not been to church for a long time but today you're here, the Lord's calling out to you. Come and pray along with us as well. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer. Follow everything I say. Say everything I say, line by line, say everything I say, word for word. And we're going to come and commit our lives to the Lord and Lord's hands. So with our heads bowed and eyes closed, let's come and pray. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness. That no matter how far we've gone, that no matter how far we've gone, you still love us. You still love us. You still call us. You still call us. Today, today, I thank you. I thank you. That you have not given up on me. That you have not given up on me. That you have sent your son Jesus. You have sent your son Jesus. To die for me, to die for me, so that I may live, so that I may live. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love. Thank, thank you for your great love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Because of you, because of you, I can be forgiven. I can be forgiven. I can be cleansed. I can be cleansed. I can be righteous. I can be righteous. And I can be faithful. And I can be faithful. Today I open up my heart. Today I open up my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Come into my life. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. With all our heads bowed and all our eyes closed, I know that some of us here and over there at Suntech, that we pray this prayer for the first time today. And if that's you, this is what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And with all our heads bowed, all our eyes closed still, at the count of three, if you pray this prayer for the first time today, I want you to lift your hand straight up. By lifting your hand up, you're saying, Pastor, I pray this prayer with you. And I want you to lift your hand because I want to know who you are and where you are because I want to pray a prayer blessing for you. And maybe you didn't pray it out loud, but in your heart you were praying along. You lift your hand straight up as well. Or maybe you didn't pray anything at all, even in your heart, but you want to make this decision right now. At the count of three, you lift your hand straight up as well. Whether you're over here or over there at Sun Tech City, you lift your hand straight up. I'm going to count right now. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. One, two, three. Just lift your hand straight up wherever you are. If you pray this prayer for the first time today, both here and over there at Suntec, up in the balcony, wherever you are, just keep your hand lifted up. Just keep your hand lifted up. Is there anyone else over there at, at, at Suntec City? Yes, we can see you through the camera. We can see your hands through the camera as well. Is there anyone else? Keep it lifted up. I want to pray a prayer blessing for you right now. Lord, I thank you for every single hand that's been lifted up. Because every hand rep represents a life and a soul. Lord, today, I ask that you fill them with your love, you fill them with your mercy, and let them know that you are a faithful God. I commit them into your hands, and I ask that, Lord, from this day forward, they will live in the present revelation of who you are in their life. They will live in the present revelation that you have a plan, a purpose, and a destiny for them. So I set them apart, I commit them into your hands. In your most mighty name we pray. 
Amen, amen. You may put your hands down right now. And church, can we just put our hands together? Can we thank the Lord for His Word? Can we thank the Lord for all that He's done? Hallelujah. 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 Hey, can we all just stand over here in Touch Center over there at Sunday? Let's all stand over here. And before we close up this service and before we have a time of ministry, I know there were quite a number of, there were some hands that were lifted up here and over at Suntech. And maybe some of you I couldn't see you, but this is what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to count to three again. And this time when I count to three, I want a few things to happen. Firstly, all those of you who lift up your hands, I want to invite you to grab your belongings and make your way down to the front over here and over there at, at Suntech because we're going to get the whole church to pray for you. Don't worry, you're not going to come alone. The friend or the whole group of friends who brought you, they'll be happy to come down with you, all right? And if FCBC members, you brought a first-time visitor, why don't you turn to him or her and say, would you like to respond? Then tell them, I'll be happy to respond together with you, all right? So I'm going to count to three, let all these things happen and, and, and even if you didn't lift up your hand just now but you want to respond, you come and respond today. So church, let's walk on them at the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, put our hands together. Let's thank the Lord over here at, at TC, over there at Suntech as well. Praise God, just come. We do want to come and pray for you over there at Suntech as well. Thank God for you. Hallelujah. Now we've got some friends over there at Suntech who responded and over here uh, as well. I just want you to look at me for a moment. Those of you who have responded today, I know you can see me through the screen as well. And I just want to tell you something. That... God is always a faithful God. And today, I'm not here as a pastor to try and trick you into becoming a Christian. I'm not here to tell you that, oh, come and be a Christian and your life will be perfect. You know what? Life will always have its ups and downs. In fact, Jesus says that there will be trouble in our life. But His promise is that He is faithful and He will be with us. And come hell or high water, we might be unfaithful, but He is always faithful. He is always there with us because His Word promises us this. He says, that you can be strong and courageous. You do not need to be terrified because the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That church is faithfulness. That no matter what happens, he will, He's not going anywhere. So can we just come and pray for our friends here? Those of you who responded, can you just close your eyes and bow your heads, both here and over there at Suntech. And all the Christians, let's stretch our hands towards them and let's come and pray a prayer and blessing for them. Lord, we thank you for our friends who have responded this morning. We commit them into your hands. We ask that, Lord, they will truly experience that you are a faithful God. Lord, we just speak this over them right now. That you will, they will see that your compassions are new every morning because great is your faithfulness. We ask that you bless them in all that they do, in their studies, in their work, in their relationships with their friends and their family. Let them be filled with your love and your presence and let them live out the destiny that you have for them. So I set them apart and commit them into your hands. In your most mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just praise the Lord. And can we just thank the Lord for their lives as they make their way to the consolidation room, both here over at Sunday. Come on, let's praise God for what He's done in their lives. Hallelujah. Well, there have been a lot of words we've been receiving over this weekend, and a lot of them are very similar. Uh, I'll just give some of the more direct one first. Uh, well, there's one that, that there's a young man here, you have an injury in your right arm. The Lord wants to bring about healing upon you. Well, uh, there are a few very key things that the Lord wants to minister to us. Well, it's all to do with this area of faithfulness. One important aspect is this, that there are some of us here that we're on the verge of giving up on our marriage. The Lord today is calling you back to faithfulness. The Lord is saying that stop trying to figure out who is taking the blame or whatever. The Lord says today, come and get right with the Lord first and He will set your path straight. So don't give up on that religion. Choose to be faithful today. Don't give the devil this foothold. Is it going to be easy? Well, it may be, it may not be. There's going to be a journey ahead of you still. But today, choose that you will be faithful. Come back and remember those vows that you have made before one another and before God. To love and to cherish 
to hold one another to death you part. That is faithfulness. Unconditional and it's perpetual. So today, and, and there have been some other words as well that they are broken relationships. This, this faithfulness is not just between a husband and a wife, but some of us between our parents, between siblings. There have been a fracture there. The Lord saying, you need to be faithful in that area. You are in that family because the Lord has entrusted you into that family. And we are called to look after one another there. The Lord wants you to come and bring about the restoration in that area. There are many of us, well, one of the reasons why we've not been faithful in, in serving the Lord is because we feel tired. The word here is that we feel overloaded. Well, the Lord says this to us. It's not just a slogan to God, you know, when He says that those who wait upon the Lord will mount up on wings of eagles. They will rise. Uh, they, will, they will run and not be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. That is the truth. That is something that we must receive. And if we feel tired and weary, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe we don't understand. Maybe there's sin that we're struggling with. Well, today, come and get right with the Lord. See, the, the devil's going to do everything he can and he's, he's going to use everything in his arsenal to make sure that you are not faithful. He'll try and bring about trouble. He'll try and lie to you. He'll try and deceive you so that you will give up. You will no longer run the race. But you know what? Who is the one who completes the race? The one who is faithful. So don't, don't, don't give that devil the foothold in your life. Don't allow him to win today. Today, there are some of us here that, that you have been unfaithful at some point of time in your life. Today, the Lord's challenging you that the new area of faithfulness He wants you to walk into is this. You need to let go of that. Receive His forgiveness. Receive His love. Receive that restoration. See, if we truly understand how faithful God is, we will truly receive the word that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Yes, we have made mistakes in the past, but, but by God's grace and by His faithfulness, I will continue to walk in that love. I will continue to walk in that righteousness for the rest of my life. See, church, faithfulness may be something that we struggle for the rest of our lives. Faithfulness doesn't mean that 100% of the time, yes, wow, we're super on fire and charging for the God, for, for the Lord. Sometimes we struggle, you know. Sometimes we fall and we end up in a slum. We end up in an unfaithful position. We fall into sin. But what is faithfulness in that moment? Faithfulness in that moment is to say, I'm not going to stay here. God, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to find you. That's why the Bible says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Cleanse yourself, you sinners. See, God knows that we're sinners. That's why we must repent. And you know what? We, we can never fall too far away from God because He is a faithful God. You are being ministered to just continue to receive that ministry. But church, let's just lift up our hands. Lord, today we want to commit ourselves to faithfulness. Lord, thank you for demonstrating to us what it means to be unconditionally faithful and more than just being perpetually faithful you have been, you are eternally faithful Lord we receive that and we thank you for your great compassion we thank you for your love and your mercy and Lord we ask that you empower us to live the rest of our lives faithful till the very end that regardless what may happen regardless what comes our way Lord we will run with you we will run that race with perseverance. We will rise up on those wings of eagles. So Lord, today come and empower us. We believe that, Lord, you are sending your reign. We believe that we're going to see the breakthrough in our ministries, in our families, in our lives. Because, Lord, you are that faithful God. And today, our response is a response of faithfulness. Teach us what it means to be faithful in every area of our lives. We thank you. We commit ourselves into your hands. Bless us, Lord. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. What do you tell the people around you? Great is His faithfulness. Great is His faithfulness. We'll see you back here next week. If you're still receiving ministry, allow the Lord to move in your life. If you need someone to pray for you, ask the leader, ask the pastor, ask them to come and pray for you. Because God is here. God is ministering to you.